Hi, this is Bill Fetter, and on this episode of How We Got Here, I thought we would talk about the history of borders and immigration. Over a million immigrants come into America every year, and this is something that's getting a lot of people's attention because it's causing a strain on the infrastructure. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, Originally, there, Genesis chapter 11, verse 9, tells of the Tower of Babel how God scattered the people. So you now have people migrating. And the world at this time was sparsely populated, consisting of relatively small number of walled cities, and then migrating nomads passing in between the cities. The Bible tells the story of the city of uh, Babylon and Ur of the Chaldees, and then migrating away from that was Uh, Nahor and Abraham, and they migrate up the Euphrates River. And then God tells Abraham and his nephew Lot, uh, leave, and they migrate some more. And they go through Canaan land, and then you have Jacob wandering, and um, uh, and then Jacob goes down into Egypt. And uh, at this time, there are no boundaries per se. Uh, It's mostly the land of uh, the the land of the Egyptians or the land of the Canaanites. And it was a general area and somewhere in there was a city. Uh, God himself came up with the idea of boundaries. And he, it says in the Bible that he distinguished between languages and ethnic groups and set the boundaries. Deuteronomy 32, eight says, when the most high gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples. And so even uh, in heaven, it says that there will be people in heaven praising God from all peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations. And so if there weren't different tongues and different nations and different tribes, that you couldn't fulfill that. So, uh, so in this sense, God is not a globalist. He's not get rid of all the borders, get rid of all the different languages. No, no, God uh, is not that. So. Uh, the earliest borders. Uh, in the record, you have Jacob working for his uncle Laban, and then he leaves with his wives and cattle, and Laban chases him, catches up with him, and they are a little tense at first, and then they set up a pillar, and they do a treaty of Mizpah, and saying that uh, they won't cross over it either one in either direction for harm. So you have a physical marker in the ground And then you have uh, the references to geological features like rivers, mountains, coasts, desert. And this is what God used when the Israelites were coming into the promised land. And so Exodus 23, 31, it says, I, the Lord, will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. And so literally... There's no other nation that was ever started with the borders being laid out before they even enter in, saying this is it. Now, why is this important? Um, Because these borders are in the Bible, that, that God is setting out borders. Moses and Joshua, right, they sent spies into the promised land. And uh, 10 of them had a bad report and Joshua and uh, her had a good report. But um, anyway, uh, Moses then takes the the report and then later Joshua and divides it up amongst the tribes with borders and with each tribe getting a specific boundary. And, And it was King David that fulfilled the fullness of the boundaries. And uh, he was at the height of his reign. And then we see an interesting story. David took a census and God uh, smote him in his conscience for doing that. You're like, well, what's wrong with a sentence? Census. Kings would take a census to count how many soldiers they had before they would go on an offensive war. And so you put it together. David was being tempted to be Alexander the Great seven centuries before Alexander the Great. Um, He was being tempted to, he filled the entire uh, geographic boundaries that God had promised Moses. David filled it up and he was being tempted to continue that. God said, no, I gave you the boundaries, stick to it. And um, now when God's people sin, 
God lets the boundaries get overrun. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, if you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. A people that you do not know will eat of your land, right? They'll cross the borders. The foreigners who reside among you will rise above you higher and higher, and you will sink lower and lower. So these foreigners are they're not Israelites. They're people that have immigrated in, but now they're above. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine or olive oil, nor any calves of your herds, lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. Pretty serious for not hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Your borders will be overrun and people will come in and they will rule you and oppress you. And that's what happened. So in 721 BC, the king of Assyria invaded across the borders of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and took them captive and scattered them. And then in 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon overran Judah's borders and took them all captive to Babylon. They were allowed to come back under King Cyrus, but then in 70 AD, Rome overran Judah's borders and scattered the Jews out of their land. And for the next 1900 years, the Jews wandered from country to country as immigrants. Rome. Now, Rome had borders and they became the biggest empire that the planet had seen up to this time. And there was a Roman emperor named Hadrian. He tried to exterminate the Jews because there were continued rebellions in the Middle East with the Bar Koba revolt of 132 AD. And so he literally went on this rampage to exterminate all Jews. Then he built Hadrian's Wall, which was the furthest borders that the Roman Empire ever had. And then those borders began to get overrun. And so this is interesting. It began in China. I think, wow, that's a far away, away from Rome. So it's third century BC. You have the Warring States period. And there is a winner named Qin Shi Huang. And in 220 AD, um, excuse me, um, the Warring States period began BC uh, with Qin Shi Huang. And he conquered other states. And he tore down the walls of the cities so that they couldn't rebel. And then the people complained, well, we don't have a wall to guard us from the Huns and later the Mongols. And so he began to build the Great Wall. And so this is Qin Shi Huang Di. And so he begins to build the Great Wall. Well, now by the fourth century AD, enough of the Great Wall is completed. This is a border of China between China and Mongolia. Enough of the wall is completed with this border that the Huns could no longer attack into China, so they turned west. And they began to attack another tribe who would be displaced and attack another tribe who would be displaced and attack another tribe. And it started this domino effect of displaced tribes across Central Asia, and they began to spill over the Roman borders. And these were... Uh, Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Lombards and Franks and Saxons and Jutes. And uh, they first came, and, and there are a lot of, of ancestors of those who have European descent, uh, Lombards and Berbers, and, and then finally Attila the Hun, and uh, Attila sacked Rome in 476 AD. Now, they first came across slow and assimilated and learned the Latin language and learned the Latin culture and then Many of them rose up and became even generals. And then they began to come faster and faster. And one time the Rhine River froze and a whole group of them just crossed of these Visigoths and they weren't driven out. And so they stayed and they kept their language and they kept their culture. And so Rome began to have all these different languages and cultures and it broke the unity of Rome up. And then weakness invites aggression. And you went from those assimilating to those coming over, but not assimilating to those coming over to attack. And so that's when you would have these different uh, warring uh, Attila sacking all these cities across Europe. 
Will and Ariel Durant wrote in The Story of Civilization, published 1944. If Rome had not engulfed so many men of alien blood in so brief a time, if she had passed all these newcomers through her schools instead of her slums, if she had treated them as men with a hundred potential excellencies, if she had occasionally closed her gates to let assimilation catch up with infiltration, she might have gained new racial and literary vitality from the infusion and might have remained the Roman Rome, the voice and citadel of the West. The attitude is, how much food do you eat in a year? Imagine if I were to make you sit down and eat it all in one day. You would die. You need food, but you only eat the food as fast as your body can assimilate the food. You need immigrants. You need new blood and new vitality and creative ideas, but you only bring them in as fast as the body politic can assimilate them. Now, uh, then you have borders overrun by Islamists. So Muhammad, his warriors, they uh, have a stirrup and a scimitar sword, and they ride on horses, and they begin to conquer, and they displace people from the Middle East, from Syria, from Egypt, and from the Byzantine Empire, and then they begin attacking Christian kingdoms, and we're talking borders, and the 11th, 12th century have different kingdoms in Europe, and they're all beginning to uh, fight over those. Uh, the oldest remaining border is in Andorra, a tiny mountainous kingdom between France and Spain, and it had its border fixed in 1278, and that little country is still there with those same borders. Um, uh, then you have um, the New World. So Spaniards brought horses to the New World, and you had tribes, and tribes had their areas, again, no border as far as a particular, but it was like regions that would belong to different tribes. Spaniards brought horses. Horses got loose and multiplied, and the Cheyenne Indians learned how to ride horses. And they were brutal, and they would drive out the other Plains Indians. So across mid-America, you had the Great Plains and the tribes with their little teepees. And, but these horses would come out of nowhere, and they would kill and pillage. And so this uh, forced migration was taking place. Uh, and then you have the Europeans coming over. Uh, first Spain, but then English, and then the French. And we focus on the French having Canada and then everything west of the Appalachians and the British having what's east of the Appalachians. So the Appalachians were a geographic border. And then again, talking borders, the uh, Mississippi River and the Ohio River become the border between uh, England and the Louisiana Territory. And then you have the end of the Revolutionary War and the Treaty of Paris, 1783, and it sets boundaries, particularly between the U.S. and Canada, the British-controlled Canada. And then other treaties, you know, the War of 1812 and treaties, and the Mexican-American War, 1848, and treaties, and even the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, we wanted to have a transcontinental railroad and needed to get some land from Mexico and across Arizona and New Mexico, and they bought the land. Um, and so we're talking borders being laid out. And now we're looking at more of the modern day. You have um, Europe and Napoleon, and he conquers Europe. And then once he's defeated Battle of Waterloo, the Europeans try to put their lives back together. And they have a Congress of Vienna in 1815, and they decide on the borders of Europe. And now the borders um, at this time, you have about 23% uh, of the world has actual borders. The rest of the world didn't. Prior to World War I, most of the world didn't have actual set borders. It was these regions or a river or whatever. Um, so World War I reset 32% of the world's borders, not just in Europe, but also in the Middle East and in Africa and in Asia. And in the 20th century, 50% of the world's borders were set. That's relatively recently. But one of the things we see happening is the more or less the weaponization of immigration. And it comes with socialism. And this is important to understand because in a sense, some of this is playing out right before our own eyes. So after World War II, you have these new borders of Europe 
and countries coming into existence and having their freedom. And the Soviet Union wants to co-opt these countries. And so they would send people into the countries, do their critical race theory and stir them up to ride and so forth. And, um, but they found that if they had immigrants come into the countries and overwhelm their infrastructure uh, and the countries would economically begin to collapse, this is called the Cloward Piven strategy. Richard Cloward, Francis Piven were Columbia University professors. And they said, it's too hard to have socialism and communism take over with tanks. You can do it through the back door through welfare programs. And so you set up a system where every immigrant immediately signs up for welfare. And as they come in, they overload the system and collapse it. And when the people can't survive, they do what? They go to the government and say, help. And the government says, we'll help. We're just going to get rid of the old leader, put in the new leader, and we're going to take control. And, and when the dust settles, you transition to a Soviet dictatorship. And so this is what was happening during the Cold War. And country after country after country would have immigrants come in, overwhelm the system. They would bring social division and fighting. Um, they would want them to keep their ethnic identities and not assimilate. And when the country turned into chaos, they would all want to overthrow their leader and put in some new leader who promised everything but ended up being a dictator, uh, a puppet of the Soviet Union. So uh, this played out in the Middle East. Uh, you have uh, the Soviet Union, Brezhnev, Khrushchev, helping start the PLO with Yasser Arafat. And uh, the PLO was when the uh, Arabs that were uh, that left and were driven out of Israel, um, the surrounding countries decided not to let them assimilate because they wanted to keep them and their political, religious, and ethnic identity as Palestinians so they could be used to bring division. Uh, and lots of them came, came into Syria. And then when they immigrated in, it overwhelmed the fragile balance taking place in Syria between the Arawaks and the Christians and the, you know, different um, Islamic groups. And it was a, a delicate balance. And uh, um, Alawites, I think is the pronunciation. It's more of a secular Muslim. Um, and then Serbia. So Serbia was Christian for a thousand years and they fought all these battles to say Christian, but they would have immigrants come in and Muslim immigrants come in and they would live in the poor neighborhoods and the cities. And then there were more of them and more of them until pretty soon they took over the cities. And then Bill Clinton recognized uh, Kosovo uh, as its independent country. And so here you have a country, a, a city and an area inside of Serbia that the immigrants come in and they end up changing the politics, changing the makeup and breaking up this country to have a new country in the middle of a, of a country. And so the idea of, of weaponizing immigration 1965 was Lyndon Johnson and Edward Kennedy, and uh, they implemented the Great Society Welfare State. And again, this is the Cloward Piven strategy. You want voters. And so if you can destabilize the economy, get people to sign up for welfare, they have a tendency to vote to keep the welfare money coming. And so the worse the economy gets, the more that sign up, the more voters you have. It's a something about humans. If if somebody's giving us free money, uh, we would sort of like to keep that coming. And so Lyndon Johnson and Edward Kennedy applied this to immigration. And they decided to change the quotas to bring in more immigrants from poorer countries and immediately sign them up for welfare. And then they would be voters for that party that continues the welfare program. It was a way to build a voter base through immigration. And so it sort of begs the question, ask yourself, uh, if every immigrant coming to America was going to turn out to be a Republican voter, do you think they would continue the policy of the way that they're doing it right now? Probably not. Anyway, so the country needs immigrants. It needs workers. It needs new life, new blood, new ideas. But you bring them in as fast as they can be assimilated. Again, you eat the food as fast as your body can assimilate it. Otherwise, it will overwhelm the system. Um, so prior to Lyndon Johnson, every immigrant was a net plus. It was a little cheaper labor. It was uh, new ideas and hard work, and they were happy to be here. And the welfare system was what? It was their extended family members. And it was the churches. There was no government welfare program. 
And so they were not a drain on the country. So bring them in, bring as many as you, you want in. Why? Because they're not a drain and they're cheaper labor and uh, they uh, can add and help the, the country to grow. When the Lyndon Johnson put in his Great Society Welfare State, every one coming in that signs up is an immediate net minus. They're an immediate drain on the economy. So the welfare program is the thing that changed it. So you had, uh, during the 1800s and 1900s, German immigrants, Irish immigrants, Jewish immigrants, Polish immigrants, Italian immigrants, immigrants from all these different countries. They usually were coming in at the bottom of the social and economic ladder. And they, their extended family would help take care of them. They'd all live together in one house and, and the churches would help take care of them. And then they would begin to get education. And then they would send their kids to school and then they would work hard. And before you know it, they owned the businesses and they started new businesses and, and new ideas and new productions. And, and as they rose in economic status, they gained uh, respect. They got involved politically and moved up the ladder, pushing everybody else up the ladder. And so this plan was observed and Booker T. Washington uh, decided that this would be a great plan to use for the freed slaves. So after the Civil War, uh, he founded the National Negro Business League, stating anyone can seek a job, but it requires a person of rare ability to create a job. We want, uh, he says, what we should do in our schools is turn out fewer job seekers and more job creators. And so Booker T. Washington goes on. At the bottom of education, the bottom of politics, even at the bottom of religion itself, there must be for our race and for all races an economic foundation, economic prosperity, economic independence. So instead of coming over and signing up for free stuff, it's coming over, helping them through extended family and churches to get on their feet, get jobs, and then begin to pool their money and, and then buy the business and send their kids to get education. Booker T. Washington continues, no man who continues to add something to the material, intellectual, um, and moral well-being of the place in which he lives is left without proper reward. Booker T. Washington says, I want to see my race live in such high and useful lives that they will not merely be tolerated, but they shall be needed and wanted. Well, anyway, we gave a broad history of borders and immigration all the way back to the Bible and up to modern times. And I hope this gives some insight uh, in this episode of how we got here. God bless you.